been talking a lot about citizenship at Six Degrees uh, over the last couple of days and at the evening events. Um, and that can mean many things to many people. Um, it can mean everything from formal citizenship, you know, where, what, where, your, where is your passport from, where do you vote, um, to a more general active citizenship. How do we engage in our communities um, on a micro level up to a macro level? Um, and I know it's been, it's been ever thus, but this moment it feels as though, and we are living with a lot of anxiety about division and who we are and, um, and the boundaries that, um, that divide us. There's anxiety about technology, about power, about agency, about the state of our democracies. Um, and all of that comes back to that question of citizenship again on with a big C and a small C. Um, how do we engage? Um, so I want to start um, um, just going around to the group and surveying everyone first before we open it up more broadly. Um, how do you define citizenship for yourself? Are you a citizen of something? And for me, um, um, be a citizen in France is more complex because um, here you are um, Inclusion, but uh, in France it's neutrality. So identity is so different. You are, for example, in France you are an identity, you French citizen. And um, for example, I am Muslim. I am wear a uh, hijab, and um, it's so difficult for me. Um, speak uh, here, speak uh, in France, speak um, in TV, speak because it's so, um, I don't know, um, where is it word? Uh, I don't know. It, it, it. <laughs> if you say it in French, I'm sure someone yeah, can yeah. <laughs> to help translate. Um, C'est mal vu. Um, I don't know. Mal vu, c'est mal vu, c'est bizarre. It's, it's bizarrely seen, yeah. Well, citizenship means many things to me, uh, and it's both um, aspirational uh, and um, full of conflict and contradictions and in a process. I grew up in the United States. I live in California. Uh, my parents were sharecroppers, uh, which meant in early in life they didn't deal in money. Um, and I sort of watch, certainly in the United States, but around the world, um, large groups of people, um, blacks, Latinos, native, native people in the United States, being there but not being there, not being able to fully participate, and not just in voting, uh, but in many institutions. And, just, and when I was growing up in the United States, I used to think 90% of the country was largely off limits. Uh, as I got older, that number probably decreased to maybe 40%. Uh, and now it's probably back up to 60 or 70%. So it's, it's a constant struggle yeah. um, in definition and, and it's very personal. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned agency and um, I think for me it's, it's something latent around agency which is this idea that you feel engaged and that you matter and that your voice counts and whether that's you know something as straightforward as being able to vote which for many people it is not straightforward um, and it is a process that is made uh, very complicated and there are barriers put in place but whether you feel you can have some kind of say in whatever form that takes um, you know growing up uh, here in this country and and having a diverse sort of uh, uh, Household, where I was exposed to various cultures and 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 and, and such, I've actually found it challenging for myself over the years, being a Canadian citizen, um, to to really kind of determine and feel like I belonged here, although I was born here. Uh, I think you know this idea of citizenship is something that you 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 find, uh, especially if you've been you know othered. Or, um, I mean, when I was, went to OCAD over there, um, I remember my first interview, and I'm talking about my work, and, 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 and the individuals that were, that were uh, interviewing me were so surprised that I spoke decent English. 
And, and, and I felt like I kind of got in because I distracted them. They were so in awe of like, that I was <laughs> speaking English that they weren't even paying attention to my work. Um, and, and, but I've ex experienced that in so many facets right here in this country, this place where I've been born and raised. And, and, and so through that, um, you know, I found what uh, citizenship means to me is, is, a, is, a, is a sense of participation. And, um, and I believe that it, for myself, you know, um, um, I'm a citizen of, of anti-oppressive thoughts and anti-oppressive uh, behaviors and, and philosophy. So that is what I'm a citizen of. I'm yeah. a citizen. Well, we've talked mostly about one thing here so far, mm. which is the sense that everybody needs to feel included and be included. And that's absolutely essential, right? So I think we need to ensure that people who because of a religion or because of a skin color or because of a clothing choices or whatever else, aren't seen as being full citizens in their countries uh, and discriminated against in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of very strong political movements who are not on our side on that, mm -hmm. and we have to stand up to them. But I think both for substantive reasons to understand what citizenship means and for more limited political reasons to actually win that debate, we also have to emphasize that citizenship is something that we have in common, and that it is more important than those differences of identity and so on. Mm -hmm. that, that part of being a citizen is to say that we hitch our fate to each other, that we have a set of common values, that we have heightened solidarity with other people within the country, and that's traditionally one of the things that, that patriotism and citizenship have been able to do for mm -hmm. us. That I might the beautiful thing about citizenship when it works well is that it can motivate you to have that form of solidarity to people who, on some other dimensions, are not very much like you. Mm -hmm. In the spaces you're in, in the communities, the nations, the, the, you know, the, the, the movements you're involved in, are people engaged? Are you seeing um, this kind of active citizenship, active engagement? And what does it look like? It's not there. People feel very disenfranchised. There are issues like economic agglomeration and, uh, you know, people uh, actually mostly in, you know, rural areas feel, do feel that they, they, their voices are not heard. Um, so that is happening to a certain extent, but we were talking quite a lot yesterday about digital spaces, and I think that that is important, but it does leave all of those other people out who are not digitally engaged, who, who do not have those avenues. Um, and... I'm quite interested in this idea about how we bridge those two groups because what Brexit showed us is that people who um, you know, were more likely to vote Remain were uh, you know, very highly educated uh, and it came down to class, essentially. So, in fact, race was no longer the, the sort of single biggest um, driver of, of that, de that decision. And... Uh, we, we kind of failed to understand that, we failed to engage in that, and people were really shocked. Everyone I know, everyone that lives in the London bubble was so shocked that people, their fellow citizens could think and feel so differently to them. Mm -hmm. so. And is that, um, uh, is, is that then a concern, I mean, just that idea of the bubble, the fact yeah. that people were shocked about that sentiment, people that were fellow citizens yeah. were surprised? Yeah, it's massively galvanizing because, I mean, all that research was done straight away. All the pollsters sort of leapt in and uh, the question was, what do we do about this? Um, and how do we create those spaces where people can engage? And we talk, we talk a lot about uh, diverse spaces, which is great. And we, we try and maintain those. And it, and it means something very different in a British context. But what we don't talk about is crossing that room and engaging with people who are different from us and actually having that conversation. So tolerance gets brought into it a lot, but actually does that mean that you engage and understand with that view that's very different with from engagement. you? Can you talk a bit about what you're seeing right now in the US around this question of citizens, citizen engagement? Um, and I know that, um, and maybe even talk about the term citizenship, because I know that you prefer membership, I believe. So could you talk a bit about that? There's a phenomenon that's happening that can't be reduced to a particular nation. This, the process of this the profound alienation, and, and, and engagement doesn't necessarily mean citizenship, uh, because one of the things that's happening is there's, this, an, there's an engagement to redefine who's the we, mm. and the we is being defined narrowly. And, you know, to be candidly, it's uh, a sort of um, a right-wing uh, ethnic national movement. 
And so it is going back to uh, the idea that certain people, because of their race, because of their religion, belong, even if they were born in the country. I mean, every, you know, certainly in North America, these countries all belong to indigenous people, but they weren't part of the citizenship. They weren't part of the we. And so the we is being contested. Uh, and, and so I think there's this profound anxiety that people have in terms of power and belonging. Um, and and I, this t take too long to say, but I would say, you know, think about it. Um, passports are only about 100 year, 150 years old. People used to travel around the world without passports. The nation states is a relatively new in invention. Uh, and citizenship within those nation states have always been predicated on some people belong and therefore can participate and are relatively equal. And a lot of people don't right. belong. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think part of the thing is can we expand that we? And I think as we expand it, we will have to expand it not just beyond race and gender and sexual orientation, we'll have to expand it beyond nation states. Yeah. Because our lives now, I mean, we all carry these cell phones that are made in, that are branded in the United States at Apple, but they're made in China. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do we live with that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to defend citizenship from, from both you and from John, because I think <laughs> you guys have, have basically sold citizenship down the river in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> because if you say that everybody has to be a citizen, and we don't make a distinction between countries, then you no longer have citizenship, right? So what you're actually saying is we shouldn't have citizenship, we should all be people around the world who all are somehow connected to each other, and that's something that, that, that it, I have a, a great degree of sympathy for, but I don't think it's going to work politically. The, the idea that we have connections to lots of different countries in the world, and that perhaps we should leave nationalism behind in the 20th century, which it so cruelly shaped, and which cruelly shaped the, the history of my own family, is very appealing and comes very naturally to me. But I think when you look at the last 20, 25 years of politics, and you don't recognize how much force nationalism still retains in the world, you're frankly being naive. And so instead of trying to say we should all be cosmopolitans who have the sort of equal allegiance to everyone in the world and have the same emotional attachment to everyone in the world, which doesn't work. I don't have that. that. I don't have that I'm because that. I ultimately have more connections to the places I've lived mm -hmm. and I'm more shocked when something terrible happens in one of the countries I've lived or one of the countries which I'm a citizen than in places which are far away. And that's, that's just, I wish it wasn't the case. I wish it wasn't the case for most people, but it is. And so I think if you realistically want to beat the very real people who want to exclude, who want to weaponize nationalism in order to actually suppress minorities in a pretty radical way, and not just in the United States, not just in Germany where I grew up, but also right here in Ontario, I think you've got to fight for the interpretation of what citizenship means. And that's got to start by saying, yes, there's something special about being Canadian. Oh, yeah. Yes, I have a special solidarity with other people in this country. Yes, it means that we democratically decide who comes into the country and who doesn't. But I'm going to fight tooth and nail for a definition of that citizenship that's inclusive. That's not based on race, it's not based on religion, it's not based on any of those things. And I think that is a more realistic uh, way of winning this argument than saying, you know, we're so interconnected, let's give up on the differences between different countries and so on. I, I agree with half of what both of you have said, and I'd like to sort of mush it together if possible. Um, I've, I've had m aspects of my identity denied, um, and, and it comes back to skin colour. There's an assumption that I'm not English because there's a failure to understand civic and ethnic nationalism. I'm English, British, a Londoner. I also happen to be an East African Asian you know, and many other things besides, and you know, whichever aspect of those identity I want to pull out at a given moment still has validity. Um, but we do tend to kind of construct a national identity, uh, you know, in relation to what it's not. Um, uh, you know, we, we construct it in relation to uh, other nation states and we try and define that very, very clearly. But that clustering happens at so many levels as well. And it, it kind of pulls in that point about divide and conquer, you know, trying to suppress various groups. We, we tend to cluster with people who are in some way similar to us. Um, and that can be very comforting. Um, there is safety in numbers. I have expressly avoided ever using the word citizen in anything I ever write.
because I know it's not an inclusive word, mm -hmm. which I think is super problematic to talk about the active pieces of citizen citizenship. Right. But I mean, I, it's, a, it's amazing to me that residence is probably the most commonly used word for people who work in municipal affairs in cities because they're very, very aware of this. Mm -hmm. But in our politics in Canada, all of the power and money to control a lot of these issues that fall in cities are actually managed at the federal and the provincial level. And so I think we have a fundamental problem, at least in Canada, that I can speak to, and that the money to address a lot of these issues that would let us get to talking about active citizenship and people seeing themselves in the we isn't in the cities, but this yeah. is where it's falling. And so John, we can I have you jump in? Because we didn't get to it earlier, but yes. your distinction about well, your preference, I think, for using membership. So in the United States, there are 11 million people who are not documented. Um, uh, so they're not quote unquote citizens, but they, but they work, they contribute, they, uh, we would not eat without them. Um, so the term citizenship is exclusive. Uh, now, what's real? So I reject your notion. First of all, I'm not saying the nation state is over, uh, but I think it's wrong. I think it's, it's too constricted. Um, if something happens to a Hindu in India, and there's a Hindu living in England, they don't say, oh, that's a different country. Those aren't my people. We have multiple identities. The reality is we have a global world. When we talk, when, when, uh, when something happens, it happens instantaneously now. Social media is like everybody's connected in some way. So it's not, in fact, that is the tension. The reality of the nation state is being challenged. Not, and it's actually a blip in history. It didn't always exist, and it won't always exist in its present form. Uh, and W.B. Du Bois talked about Pan-Africanism. When Cuba sent people to fight in Africa, they sent blacks mm -hmm. to fight in Africa on the side of South Africa. That was the first place Nelson Mandela went when he got out of prison, was to Cuba, not to England. Uh, so people have multiple identities and have multiple memberships and the nation state actually is too constricted. And people Absolutely we have multiple identities. The big question is how big a piece of that should citizenship be? Mm -hmm. And I think that if you want to make a multi-ethnic society work, and Canada is probably uh, the most promising experiment in that in the world, because we don't have many e examples in history of multi-ethnic democracies that work for a long time. We don't have Canada, many examples I think, of is the, democracy is, is, is working. One of the most promising examples. <laughs> we don't have many examples of democracy working. Yeah. Period. Yeah. We're we're still an experiment, and the United States is supposed to be the great experiment. Yeah. It's a troubled experiment. It, it's it, not just a blip in history yeah, but, that Native Americans weren't included. Right. There's it's many just, problems in our country. There's many problems, certainly in the United States at the moment. There's many problems in Canada. There's many problems in every democracy in the world. But it's also easy to become very cynical, and to say everything is basically the same. There are so many problems here, but we shouldn't look at what is good in this country and what we want to defend in terms of our values. Look into history, look around the world, and name me a society that treats its minorities better than a liberal democracy. Name me a period in history when people who are not part of a majority group were treated with more respect than they are, despite all of the problems today in North America and Western Europe. And I think if we don't look at that, then we don't become willing to actually defend some of the you most and I basic know elements of yeah. our political system. one thing. Yeah. You and I know each other. You know I'm not cynical. The thing is, is that if you say this is the only way to be, and if you don't be this, it's cynical, I'm saying we need a future. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm saying the democracy that the United States represents, the democracy to some extent that Canada represents, is not the future. You there. And yeah. Mariam, I want to bring you in because in your opening statements, you talked about the fact that you wanted to, ex your work is really about expanding the idea of what it means to be French, what it means to be a French citizen. How can that definition, which was narrow, become a broader definition? So can you talk about, about the work that you're doing on that, on that front? Um, French citizenship um, is connected with nationality, French nationality. And uh, when, for example, when teachers uh, in the school uh, speak about uh, citizenship, um, he said, uh, you have a right and you, are, you have um, uh, duties. And, uh, for example, the voting right, and uh, you want uh, respecting, and, uh, respecting the law. And the notion of citizenship uh, are reduced law and duties. And uh, I think um, if we 
um, won't speak, uh, how do we re-engage citizenships in, in the world, in the, in the country, it's necessary to focus on young. Because um, we have to raise awareness mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, young people and because it's the future, it's the future of the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, now people don't understand what is citizenship. And uh, I think uh, pedagogy, uh, no, pedagogy, um, uh, pedagogy. Pedagogy. Um, in the school, uh, and um, I think it's mm -hmm. a great uh, solution. Uh, I, I'm happy to speak about uh, after Marion because I've just uh, saying things in, in the same meaning. In fact, in France and, and Italy, we are, there are less and less. Uh, people voting. They, they mean they, they are citizens. They have the right to vote, but they don't. So there is uh, some people who are coming to this country and they, they wish to be citizens, they wish to be admitted in this uh, larger community, which is uh, France, but they have no right to vote because they have not la carte de séjour or any passport. And there is another number, very high, that has all the rights and they don't, yes, uh, use them. So this, this is really a problem. And I've, I feel like we're tinkering at the edges of a very high level, big C citizenship, you know, a legal definition, um, something that is extremely stable. And I think we, we need to talk much, much more about that small C citizenship, which is extremely nebulous and it's, it's latent and it's, mm -hmm. it's taken away from us at a moment's notice. And some people have more of it and some people have less of it. And we need to question why that is and why people feel that they cannot participate. When we were having coffee before, you were talking about terms like integration, inclusion, and how all of those words are difficult words because in some ways they imply a, an us and a them or here is a, a fixed nation in which new people to that place have to then adjust themselves and adapt themselves. Yes. Um, we talk a lot in the UK at the moment about social integration, that seems to be our buzzword, and it is uh, perhaps in the current context the the least bad word we can use to describe that form of belonging, but it strongly implies that there is something very clearly defined to integrate into. Um, and within that, we also talk about British values. We still don't know what they are. It's an ongoing debate. Don't talk about it. You know, we just <laughs> sweep them under the carpet. Um, and uh, I think social connection is possibly a more useful definition of what we're trying to get at. Uh, which I think defending the nation state as it is, is a lost cause. I think we do have to reimagine the nation state. Uh, and not just because, I mean, if you think of the, the attack on the nation state, it gets organized around immigration, uh, the fight in, about BRIDEX. So, uh, and, and in some ways, we sort of acknowledge that the nation state as it existed was problematic. And that's one of the reasons we experimented with the EU. Mm -hmm. It's like, and, and the people who voted to stay also not only had a British identity, but had a European identity, mm -hmm. a new constructed identity. Mm -hmm. Uh, with legal implications and legal rights, the right to move, the right to work, the right to go to school. So we're constantly experimenting. So what I'm saying, which I think Charles was saying, is like, can we continue these experiments? The, the narrow NASA state led to two bloody world wars in less than 30 years. It simply doesn't work. I would say if we go back to that, it's not that we, we actually are going back to something that was already failed, mm -hmm. and the world is moving forward. So, I so for example, in the UN came to the agreement that refugees should be accepted and treated well. They have rights. Refugees. The United States just violated those rights. These are not immigrants in a, in a traditional sense. These are people who are being pushed out of their land, largely because of US and Western policies <laughs> are creating conditions that they can't live in their land. Uh, and they come on our shores and it's like, nope, you're not American. Uh, so that's what, it's, so I, what I'm saying is that yes, these multiple identities at the, at the nation level, at the international level, at the local level, we have to sort of rethink that. We have to rethink that in the 21st century. And just I want to add just one other thing. We use the concept belonging, like you use the concept belonging. And our concept of belonging is different than integration. 
because integration, at, at least in the U.S. context, suggests you're joining something that's already there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, from our perspective, belonging is you're joining something and you're co-creating a new future. Yeah. And, and part of your belonging is the right to co-create. So you're not just a guest in somebody else's house. You're participating in co-creating something that you belong to. Mm. I'm, I'm worried that you look around the world and the big trend of the last 15, 20 years is the rise of right-wing nationalists, far-right nationalists, who are antithetical to every single one of our values. And I think when we think about values, everybody on this stage has pretty similar values. I'm sure we disagree on one or two things, but, but I think obviously you and I, we know each other, we have very similar values in a bunch of things. I think probably all, all of us on this stage do. Mm. But I think that if we give up on citizenship and if we give up on a real notion of patriotism, it is going to leave the incredible emotional reservoir that exists in this space to the people who want to weaponize it in order to discriminate against minorities, in order to destroy our democracies. And so I think we have to fight for the interpretation of what it means yeah. and say, you know what? It is possible to love your husband or wife, to think that you have special obligations towards them without being disrespectful to anybody else in the world. And it's possible to love your country and to say that you have special obligations towards other fellow citizens of yours mm -hmm. and yet be respectful of other countries as well. And I think if we do that, we are much, much more likely to actually get to not just include people, but preserve our political system. Because there's an ultimate question, which is how do we want to be governed? And in the end, I think that the answer to that we want to give is that we don't want uh, a, a dictator or a priest or a monarch to tell us how to live. We want to decide together how to live. But who is part of that together? Who is the we who make this decision? You've got to bound it. It can't be everybody in the world. It's got to be the people who rule a particular country. So and so let's overcome the exclusions. Let's, but let's defend the notion of citizenship and say, yes, we together as citizens will de determine our fate and try to be gentle and inclusive to each other. I think what's come up for everyone here is um, uh, how do we, how do we um, imagine a new citizenship? How do we imagine new nations that are more inclusive, where, that, that are more engaged, that, that, um, that, that um, are new models of, of this sort of engagement or, or a vision of belonging? United States. Um, the concept of citizenship uh, in, entails equality in it, um, legal equality, uh, political equality, access to representation, things like that. Um, but as we know, that's not really in practice how, how this operates. Um, we have a world in which um, people who could fit, a number of people who could fit on that stage own men, own um, as much wealth as the bottom half of the population. And in a very real sense, that, that means that citizenship cannot be equal in a situation like that where economic power and um, access to economic um, economic wealth just is incredibly unequal. So I'm wondering in what sense um, that a system that allows that to continue, it allows that kind of wealth, disparities in wealth and economic power um, has to be challenged in order for a real uh, citizenship in order to be, to emerge. And um, if the people on stage agree with that, and if so, um, what needs to be done or what actions need to be taken by people here who, who do want a real um, concrete, <coughs> practical form of citizenship um, what needs to be done and, and bring that into being. Great. The, the young people today are very skeptical about democracy. Uh, millenniums in the last election, 16% of those eligible voted. A number of them say they care more about their student loan than about democracy because it doesn't affect their lives in a positive way. And I think, yes, the sort of unequal wealth and power, we have to sort of accommodate that. Now, notice the unequal wealth and power is a global system. It's not a national system. The elites in the United States hang out with the elites in Canada, hang out with the elites in, in, in uh, England. Uh, so part of what I'm suggesting and, and part of what I think you're asking, Rachel, is like, how do we actually move forward? And I think part of it is recognizing that we can't have these narrow categories. And I'm not saying we end citizenship or we end the nation state, but we have to have mechanisms that allow us to actually con connect and celebrate and belong at a global level. Um, but I am hopeful, uh, partially because of the work that you guys are doing here, uh, because people are grappling with these issues, but the stresses on democracy, the stresses on citizenship are gonna be worse, not better. 
uh, because we're going to have more technology, we have more people movement, we have more globalization, we have more concentration of wealth. We have to sort of step up our game and, as Charles suggested, reimagine citizenship at different levels. Stuff. We can do more. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine. David Leonard is coming up to do a bit of housekeeping. So if you want to come up. Uh, so thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Merci, Mariam. Thank you, John, Jamisha, Charles, Yasha. That was wonderful. Um, as Rachel said, that was a lot of, of stuff to process. And the good news is at 1.30 today in the What's Next session, uh, you have the opportunity to process that. So uh, we'll have our facilitator, we'll have John and Adrian, uh, and we'll have all of you uh, for What's Next at 1.30. Coming up right after this. Yes, this is, yes. <laughs> You know what, here, John, here, so I'm going to pass this to John to really emphasize the point that this, this What's Next session is the heart and soul of Six Degrees. Yeah, I mean, we've done this two or three times before, and people sort of think, oh, well, it's the end, and we've had the meat and potatoes, we're going home now, and all that kind of stuff. At 1.30, we actually try to not put together an action program, but to actually understand what Charles has been saying, what everybody here has been saying, all since Monday night. And can we make any sense of this? So if you're not here, you're not really helping us make sense of what we've been doing. So you all have to be there. We have to hear from you. And not to bring in a lot of new things, but to write, understand what has been said. Mm. What does it mean? Two and a half days. What does it mean? Mm. Well, and that's about, no, that's perfect. That's exactly right. Frankly, I'd rather having that come from John than from me. So um, before that, however, we do have a few things. Uh, the next exchanges are happening in about 15 minutes. Uh, and those are uh, right up here. We've got an uh, inclusion, youth, and the future of work, which is with our partners at RBC. At this stage, we've got Prophets of Dystopia, which is talking about art and activism. Uh, and then we've got in the Education Commons, Closed Shops, which is about um, uh, engineers and, uh, and inclusion. Uh, and that, and, and oh yes, and there's a book signing. Thank you. I was getting a book signal made at me, and I didn't know what it meant. Uh, there is a book signing uh, at our book table, which is at the other end of the Education Common directly after this. So uh, thank you for your attention for this. See you at 1.30 and also before. <laughs>